The Devil, Part 1 As the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, Hebrews 2.14. The devil is a very prominent personality in the religions of Christdom. He is perceived to be a god of evil, and of necessity one who is far more successful than God himself, on the basis of souls captured and eternally ruled over. Jesus tells us, wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in there at Matthew 7.13. According to the theory of traditional Christianity, this means eternal hell torture for billions of people, under the control of the devil, with never any hope of escape, while it also says, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it Matthew 7:14. are those few that God is able to persuade to follow his way, remember, hell is taught by traditional Christianity is forever, therefore the devil of their teaching is also forever. This is the dismal pattern now being set for all eternity for this beautiful universe, that the vast majority of mankind are hopeless slaves of the devil in eternal tortures, billions and billions of people tortured forever for 70 years of sins. Is this theory scriptural? Does the Bible actually teach such a dreadful and frightful concept? Is it possible that God has created the vast majority of people to the end that, after a brief unhappy life, they may scream in torture forever after? While it may be true that this teaching does not receive the focus and emphasis it once did, it is just as much as ever an inescapable part of the official doctrine of traditional religion. This picture cannot be avoided. It must be faced as the inseparable consequence of the immortal soul, burning hell, personal devil theories. Dislike it as they may, orthodox Christians must face up to this hideous eternal nightmare as the inevitable outcome of the theories they promote and endorse. Again, the most important question, is it scriptural? This lesson, and the lesson following, will carefully consider what the Bible actually has to say about this subject. There is a Bible devil. To be fair, there are some points upon which the Bible is in agreement with traditional Christianity. Truly the Bible does speak of a devil. Both represent the devil as the great enemy of mankind, subtle, evil and powerful, who must be faced and attacked and overcome to attain to salvation and escape eternal punishment. However, Bible teaching parts company with traditional Christianity regarding the type and duration of the eternal punishment as we will observe in this lesson. Who or what is the Bible devil? Does it even matter? Very much so. The briefest consideration reveals that it is essential that we know who or what the devil is and how to successfully combat and overcome him or it. The devil is to all practical purposes commonly perceived to be omnipotent and omniscient, for while supervising the eternal torture of billions already in hell, he is at the same time capable of simultaneously tempting the entire population currently in existence on the earth. Anyone who will be ruling increasing billions to all eternity is obviously very close to God in power. The devil is also commonly regarded as being immortal. Some Christian denominations actively teach this, some do not, but all logically necessitate it, for if hell and eternal torture is forever, then the devil has to be forever also. Obviously hell cannot just run itself, and to think of the devil being destroyed, and hell running right on forever without him makes the traditional picture seem even more absurd. But what does the Bible say? An immortal sinner is a scriptural impossibility if there is one thing the scriptures make plain, it is the inseparability of sin and death, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23, the soul that sinneth, it shall die, Ezekiel 18.4, by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, Romans 5.12, lust bringeth forth sin, sin bringeth forth death, James 1.15. This is God's immutable law. He is righteous and holy, and this universe is his. It has no place for immortal sinners. Immortality is related only to holiness. Immortal sinners are a pagan superstition. The myths of the heathen are full of them. Similarly, and on the same premise, a sinning immortal is a scriptural impossibility. The common conception that the devil is a fallen angel cast out of God's holy heaven for rebellion is a terrible, fleshly travesty of the true beautiful picture from God of the perfect relationship between God and the holy angels. If this conception were true, which we fervently thank God it is not, and if rebellion of holy immortals is possible, 
then the present heavenly condition among the angels, and the future promised immortal condition of the redeemed, who are to be equal to the angels, Luke 20 36, is no improvement on this present veil of evil, uncertainty and tears, if sin is possible in the eternal, immortal state, then what is it all worth, what is the purpose of striving for it? The Bible devil is sin personified. The Bible devil is sin, sin in every aspect and manifestation. It is particularly the very root of sin, sin in the flesh, the law of sin in the members, the inherent tendency of all human flesh, since Adam's fall and sentence, toward evil, unholiness and opposition to God and his wise, holy, life-giving commands. The scriptures tell us that Jesus partook of human nature and died for the express purpose of destroying the devil, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, Hebrews 2.14, he partook of weak, mortal, human flesh so that by dying he could destroy the devil. Ponder this scriptural fact long and well, be sure it fits your conception of what the devil is and how the devil was destroyed by Christ. This passage contains the key to the understanding of this subject. What did Christ overcome? What did he nail to the cross in repudiation and condemnation that by death he might destroy the devil? Hebrews 2.14, that he might take away the sin of the world. John 1.29, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 9.26, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Romans 6.6. 6. These passages clearly show the Bible devil is not the supernatural monster of Christendom. It would be an utter absurdity to say that Christ was made of weak human nature so that by death he could destroy such a powerful, immortal creature. But, by his perfect life and his voluntary, sacrificial death, he did destroy in himself the Bible devil and his works. He totally overcame and held powerless the innate motions of sin. The law of sin in the members or the sin in the flesh of which Paul speaks is what was dealt a blow. Finally in triumph he nailed it to the cross in total defeat and condemnation of sin and vindication of God. By this process Christ totally and eternally freed himself from the Bible devil that has all mankind in hopeless bondage, as far as their own efforts are concerned. This freedom he has personally achieved, he now offers to all who repudiate and crucify the Bible devil. This Bible devil is sin in the flesh. They must crucify it in themselves and make themselves part of him by baptism and total loving devotion and obedience after that. The devil has the power of death. We also learn here, Hebrews 2.14, that the devil has the power of death. This is a further positive proof that the devil is not a person. The power of death is manifestly the ultimate power. As a person, only God has the power of death, as he has all power. The debased orthodox conception that God would give the supreme ultimate power of death to an evil creature like the orthodox devil is an absurd and monstrous idea. But the Bible says the devil has the power of death. Yes, that is true. Sin does have the power of death, not in the sense of possessing an authority that only God controls, but in the sense that sin inevitably brings death, and all who serve sin receive death as his, sins, wages. Apart from this deliverance provided in Christ, Sin in the flesh, also called law of sin in the members, inexorably takes every human being into eternal death. Here indeed is something possessing the power of death that is still in full harmony with God's eternal, exclusive possession of all power. Jesus' mission was, by death, to destroy that which has the power of death, that is, sin. Jesus' mission is to totally destroy sin from the earth, first in himself and then universally, and, with sin, also death, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, John 1.29, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, Hebrews 9.26. Sin is personified. We find that sin is vividly personified as a master, a destroyer, a deceiver in the Bible. Look at these verses. Sin hath reigned unto death, Romans 5.21, sin wrought in me, Romans 7.8, sin deceived me, sin slew me. Romans 7:11 To whom ye yield yourselves to obey, his servants ye are, whether of sin. Romans 6:16 6, Let not sin reign in your body, that ye should obey it. Romans 6:12 The Bible devil is this personification of sin. Many things are personified in scripture with impressive effect and interest. Riches, ye cannot serve two masters, God and Mammon Matthew 6:24. Wisdom, 
Wisdom hath builded her house, hewn out her seven pillars, Proverbs 9, 1, Israel, I will build thee, O virgin of Israel, Jeremiah 31, 4, Jerusalem, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, Isaiah 52, 1, the redeemed, the marriage of the Lamb, his wife hath made herself ready, Revelation 19, 7, the elements of nature, floods clap their hands, hills are joyful, Psalm 98, 8, waste places sing, Isaiah 52, 9, the devil, or the motions of sin, sin in the flesh is also personified under the name of the old man, put off the old man with his deeds, Colossians 3, 9, put off the old man, put on the new man, Ephesians 4 24 our old man is crucified with him, Romans 6, 6, this last quotation is especially notable, Christ is the pattern and the example, he crucified the old man the devil in both his life and his death, so must we, crucify the flesh with its affections and lusts, Galatians 5 24, if ye put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live, Romans 8 13, Jesus tells us to take up the cross and follow him, Matthew 10 38, also we find Paul saying that, by his self-disciplined and sacrificial life, he was crucified with Christ, Galatians 2 20, why so much personification, why do the scriptures use so much personification, is there not a danger of it being confusing and misleading, as with the common idea of the devil and the Holy Spirit, not for the right people, not for the diligent, loving student of the word, and these are the only ones who matter to God, God deliberately confuses the shallow, the fleshly minded and the wicked, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned that believe not the truth, 2 Thessalonians 2 11, 12, these are very strong words, from a loving and merciful God, we do well to heed them, God is indeed a loving Father to those who totally seek Him, but to no others, these proofs and examples of personification furnish an answer to the question why sin in the abstract should be personified, they show, first, that principles and things are personified in the Bible, and, second, that this is done with great advantage, there is a warmth in such style of speech, which is wanting in expressions that conform to the strict proprieties of grammar and fact, this warmth and expressiveness are characteristic of the Bible in every part of it, and belong to the Oriental languages generally, of course it is open to abuse, like every other good, but its effectiveness is beyond question, the subject of the devil and sin is an excellent illustration, sin is the great slanderer of God in virtually denying his supremacy, wisdom and goodness, and it is the great ground of accusation against human beings, even unto death, how appropriate, then, to style it the accuser, slanderer, liar, this is accomplished with great effectiveness by the use of the term devil, but through the word not being translated but merely anglicized, the English reader, reared with English theological prejudices, is prevented from seeing it. There are two parts to this lesson. Please click on part 18b to view the rest of the lesson.